40 Hadith and Exposition, 2nd Revised Edition, Author Sayyid Ruhullah Musri Khomeini. 31st Hadith, The Indescribability of God, the Prophet, and the Imams. Arabic Text, English Translation. With my continuous chain of transmission reaching the August Sheikh, the best of the traditionalists, Muhammad ibn Ya'qub al Kuleni, from Ali ibn Ibrahim, from his father, from Hamad, from Rabi'i, from Zurura, from Abu Ja'far alayhi salam, Zurara says, I heard him say, Verily God, the Almighty and the Glorious cannot be described, and how could he be described when he declares in his book, and they measure not God with his true measure? Hence, he cannot be described by any measure, and if described, he would transcend it. And verily the Prophet ﷺ cannot be described. And how could he be described a servant whom God, the Almighty and the Glorious has concealed with seven veils and made obedience to him in the earth like obedience to him in the heavens, declaring, And whatsoever the Messenger gives you, take it. And whatsoever he forbids, abstain from it. And he has declared, Whoever obeys him assuredly obeys me, and whoever disobeys him disobeys me. Hence he has delegated authority to him. And we, Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, cannot be described. And how could a people be described whom God has kept free from impurity, which is doubt? And neither can the believer be described. And indeed, when the believer takes his brother with the hand on meeting him, God looks at them, and sins are shed from their faces in the way leaves fall from a tree. Exposition To take up the explication of the phrase, وَمَا قَدْرُ wa وَمَا قَدْرُ And they measure not God. Al-Jawhari says in this regard, Qadr means measure, and Qadr both with Fatha on the Dal, that is Qadr, and Sukun on it, Qadr has the same meaning. It is a verbal noun, Mazdar. God the Exalted says, which means, وَمَا قَدْرُ اللَّهُ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ Which means, مَا عَزَّمُ اللَّهُ حَقَّ تَعْزِيمِهِ They do not venerate God in the way he ought to be venerated. In the opinion of this writer, قَدْر apparently means measure and has been used figuratively to indicate the incapacity to describe and venerate adequately. Description of Tawseef itself is a kind of measurement of the object described in the apparel of characterization, and this, as shall be pointed out later, God willing, is neither possible nor permissible for anyone else to do in relation to that sacred being. As to the phrase, فَلَا يُوسَفْ بِقَدْرَةِ There is بِقُدْرَةٍ with atta in the version of Murhum al-Majlisi, and he has considered it to signify comparison. Also, he is of the opinion that the singling out of power, Udra, from among the attributes is due to its being closer to understanding. Then, affirming the possibility of error in the manuscript, he says, possibly it may be read with Fatha, that is Qadr, as in some other traditions. The version of Al-Wafi accords with his guess, and perhaps it may be Qadrihi with Ha in some manuscripts, but it is probable, or rather certain, that Biqudratin with Atta is an error in the manuscript, for it is neither eloquent from the viewpoint of meaning nor proper on the basis of wording, for a masculine pronoun is referred to it, and to explain its away will be contrary to the rule. The context offered little room for a maneuver, and hence this explanation of Marhum al Majlisi, even though there is no reason for asserting that while it is possible to conceive the attribute of power, it is impossible to conceive other attributes, thus distinguishing it from other attributes. Accordingly, this explanation did carry much weight in his own blessed opinion. As to the word tatahattu, as Johri says in the Siha, Arabic text that is hat, means the falling of leaves from the branch of a tree. He further says tahatta ashayu tanafar, which is Tanathur also gives the meaning of falling and scattering. Now we shall explain the relevant points of the noble tradition in a number of sections. The Indescribability of God 
It should be known that the indescribability of God, the exalted, mentioned in this tradition, refers to the characteristics of God given by some victims of ignorance and disputation from among the theologians Mutakallimun and others, whose statements implied finitude, tahdid, and anthropomorphism, tashbih, or rather the very denial of the divine attributes, ta'til. That such is the case is indicated by this phrase in the noble tradition, Arabic text, وَمَا قَدْرُ اللَّهُ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ Some traditions of the noble al-Kafi in the chapter concerning prohibition on characterization, Nahi and al dawsif also affirm this. Arabic text, English translation, in al-Kafi al kulaini reports with his isnad from Abd al-Rahim ibn At-Iq al-Qasr, that he said, I wrote a letter to Abu Abdullah السلام, which I sent through Abdul Malik ibn Ayyan, informing him that there are some people in Iraq who characterize God with form and features. Dakhtik. I wrote, May God make me your ransom. If you consider it fit, write to me the correct doctrine of divine unity. He wrote back to me, May God be merciful to you. You have questioned me concerning Tawheed and the belief held by a group of people over there. Exalted is God, and there is nothing like him, and he is the all-hearing and the all-seeing. He is above the descriptions of the anthropomorphists, Mushabbihah, who liken God to his creation and ascribe falsehoods to him. May God have mercy upon you. Know that the right doctrine of Tawheed is that which has been revealed in the Qur'an concerning the attributes of God, the Almighty and the Glorious. Negate ta'til, the negation of attributes, as well as tashbih in relation to God the Exalted. Hence, neither the attributes are to be negated, nor God is to be likened to anything. He is God, the self-subsisting, at the thabit, and the existent, the mawjud. Exalted is he above what the describers attribute to him. Go not beyond the Qur'an, or you will go astray after the clear exposition of the truth. If one reflects properly on the contents of this noble tradition and its earlier and latter parts, one comes to know that the prohibition concerning the characterization of God does not mean, as stated by some eminent traditionalists, that one should refrain absolutely from reflecting on the attributes or describing the attributes of God, because this tradition, like some others, directs one to negate ta'til and tashbih, something which is not possible without reflection on the attributes and a complete knowledge of them. That which the Imam wants to say is that one should not attribute to God the exalted anything that is not worthy of his sacred essence, such as the attribution of form, features, and other characteristics of the creatures, which entail imperfection and contingency in Khan, and God is above these. However, as to describing God the Exalted by attributes that suit him, it has a sound discursive basis in the transcendental sciences or Lum al Aliya. Hence, it is something desirable, and the Book of God, the Sunnah of the Messenger, and the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt are replete with it. The Imam himself has made a brief reference in this noble tradition to that right discursive approach, though any elaboration of it is outside the scope of our discussion. As to the statement of Imam al-Sadiq that one should not go beyond the divine scripture in one's descriptions of God, it is a prescription for those who are ignorant of the criterion concerning metaphysical speculation about the attributes. It does not mean that it is impermissible to ascribe an attribute that is not mentioned in the Book of God. Accordingly, that master, in spite prescribing this for his addressee, mentions two attributes and names of God, self-subsisting, a thabit and existent al mawjud which, as such, do not occur in the divine scripture. True, if someone with an undeveloped intellect, full of conjectures and imaginings, and unilluminated with the light of Gnosis, Ma'rifah, and hidden divine assistance, were to describe God with some attribute, he would inevitably fall either into the error of ta'dil and negation of the attributes, or into the perdition of tashbih. Hence, it is essential for people like us whose hearts are covered with thick veils of ignorance and self-love and perverse habits and dispositions to refrain from reaching out towards the world of the hidden and abstain from carving out deities for ourselves. For whatever we conceive in our imagination would be no more than our own creation. However, it should not remain unsaid that when we say that such people should extend their hand towards the world of the hidden, 
We do not mean to recommend that they continue to remain in ignorance and egoism, nor now the Billah we call them to blaspheme his names regarding which it has been said, Arabic text. English translation, and leave those who blaspheme his name, Surah 7, verse 180. Nor do we stop them from learning the transcendental teachings, Ma'arif, which are the apple of the eye of the awliya of God and the basis and foundation of religion. Rather, this is itself a call for the removal of these dark curtains and a warning that as long as man remains a victim of self-attention and the love of the world, a captive of mundane ambition, love of wealth and the self, and like this author, a prisoner within the walls of nuisance, error, egoism, and narcissism, which are the thickest of all darkening veils, he would remain deprived from knowing the true teachings, Madhav, and attaining to his real goal. If, God forbid, there were no hidden, secure from God, the exalted, and his perfect awliya, one would not know where his matter would ultimately end and to what destination his movement and journey would lead him. Arabic text, English translation, My God, I address my complaint to you and seek your help. We, wanderers of the realm of ignorance, lost in the wilderness of error and self-seeking and self-centered amusements, who came into the dark world of mulk and nature and like bats did not open the eye of real vision, to behold the fair reflection of your beauty in the mirror of things, big and small, nor the manifestations of your light throughout the levels of the heavens and the earths, blind of eyes and insensate of heart. We have passed our days and spent a lifetime in ignorance and self-forgetfulness. Should your unbounded grace and your infinite and effulgent mercy assist us not by lighting a spark within the heart and infusing a passion within the soul, we would languish forever in this perplexity of ours and get nowhere. But, Arabic text, such is not what we expect of you. Your favors preceded any worthiness on our behalf, and your mercy is ever unearned. O oh God, out of your kindness secure us, and guide us to the lights of your beauty and majesty, and illuminate our hearts with the radiance of your names and attributes. Impossibility of knowing the reality of your, the names and the attributes. It should be noted that the knowledge of the reality of the divine attributes and their encompassment as well as their nature is some whose summits lie beyond the reach of metaphysical proof Burhan and whose kernel is beyond access to the yearning of the Gnostics. That which has been said from the viewpoint of metaphysical proof is in the speculative thought of scholars of formal metaphysics or in the discussions of the adept in the terminology of Gnosis concerning the names and the attributes is correct and well-reasoned in a accordance with their approach. However, learning ilm itself is a thick veil, and as long as it is not pierced with the secure of the all-glorious, and in the shadow of perfect piety, intense mortification, complete dedication, and sincere supplications to the Lord, the lights of divine beauty and glory do not appear in the wayfarer's heart, and the heart of the emigrant towards Allah does not succeed in attaining to the witness of the unseen. And the manifest presence of the manifestation of the names and the attributes, to say nothing of the manifestation of the essence. These statements should not deter one from research and study, which are themselves reminders of the truth, for it happens only rarely that the sacred plant of Marifa grows and reaches fruition in the heart without the seed of the true sciences and their customary conditions. Hence, one should not abstain at the outset from the pursuit of the sciences with due observance of all its prerequisites and auxiliaries, for it has been said, Arabic text. The sciences are the seed of Gnostic disclosures, and should the sciences fail to produce for one a complete result in this world on account of certain obstacles, they would inevitably bring the desired fruits in the other world. But the main thing is the observance of their prerequisites and conditions, some of which were discussed in the exposition of certain foregoing traditions. Knowledge of the spiritual reality of the prophets and the awliya is unattainable through rational thought. It should be known 
that the knowledge of the spirituality and the station of perfection of the major prophetic figures and the infallible awliya in general and those of the sale of the Prophet وسلم, in particular is not attainable by means of thought or journey through the horizons and the souls of and Fus, Surah 41 verse 53 that because those venerable personages belong to the divine lights of the unseen and are the complete manifestation and the manifest signs of divine glory and beauty, having reached in the spiritual journey towards God, the ultimate extremity of self-annihilation, fana of body, and the ultimacy of ascent to the point of two bows, length or nearer, Abba Qawsain, O Adna, Surah 53, verse 9. Though the latter station belongs specifically to the seal of the prophets and other wayfarers, in their ascension are followers of his sacred being. Here we do not intend to describe the nature of the journey of that sacred personage and the difference between his spiritual ascent, Mi'raj, and the ascents of other prophets and awliya. For the sake of the present discourse, we shall confine ourselves to mentioning one tradition pertaining to their luminosity, for the perception of their luminosity also requires an inner light and a divine gravitation. Arabic text English translation in Al Kafi Al Kulaini reports with his Isnad from Jabir from Abu Jafar alayhi salam. Jabir says, I asked him concerning the knowledge of the knowing one, Al Alim, that is an Imam. He replied, saying, O oh Jabir, verily there are five spirits in the Prophets and the Osiya, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Faith, the Spirit of Life, the Spirit of Power, and the Spirit of Appetite. By the means of the Holy Spirit, O Jabir, they know everything from the throne to underneath the earth. Then he added, O Jabir, all the four spirits are subject to vicissitudes, but not the Holy Spirit, which, which does not engage in diversion or play. Arabic text. English translation, in al kafi al Kulaini reports with his isnad from Abu Basr that he said, I asked Abu Abdullah concerning the statement of God, the blessed and the exalted, and thus have we inspired in you, O Muhammad, the spirit of our command, though knows not what the scripture was, nor what the faith, Surah 42, verse 52. He replied, the spirit mentioned in the verse is one of the creatures of God, the blessed and the exalted greater than Jibra'il and Mika'il, that was with the Messenger of God وسلم, and which used to inform and guide him, and after him it is with the Imam From the first tradition, one comes to know that the Prophets and the Awsiya possess a sublime spiritual station, which is called the Holy Spirit, Ruh al-Qudus, that is the Spirit of Holiness. By the means of that station, they encompass all the particles of the universe, epistemically and ontologically, in that spirit, there is no negligence, sleep, error, forgetfulness, and other vicissitudes associated with contingency or any of the changes and deficiencies pertaining to the realm of mulk. Rather, it belongs to the world of the immaterial and seen in the greater Jabarut. From the second tradition, one comes to know that the spirit is perfectly non-material and greater than Jibra'il and Mika'il, who are the greatest inhabitants of the station of proximity of the Jabarut. Yes, the Uliya, whose natural form, Dina, has been fashioned by God, the exalted with the mighty hands of his own beauty and majesty, and manifested himself in the first manifestation of the essence, the Jalliya Dhati Awali, with all the names, attributes, and the all-inclusive station of unity, Maqam al Tijam, in their perfect mirror, and initiated them into the reality of the names and the attributes in the unseen privacy. Of the divine Ibsiti, the majesty of their glory and beauty is beyond the reach of the aspirations of the Gnostics, and the summit of their perfection is beyond access to the Gnostic endeavors of the people of the heart, and it is mentioned in the tradition of the Prophet. Ali is immersed in the essence of God, the exalted. In former days, this author, like a bat describing the world illuminating sun, has described a modicum of the station of prophethood and wilaya in a separate treaty named Misbah al-Hidayah, the waiting of the seven hijabs mentioned in relation to the prophet. Several probable meanings have been suggested for these words of the noble tradition, Kaifa Yusuf. 
عبد احتجب الله عز وجل به سبحا. And here we shall mention some of them. First is the one suggested by the perfect Gnostic and traditionists, the Marhum Fayt. It is narrated in a tradition that there are 70,000 veils of light and darkness for God, the exalted. Were he to remove them, the lights of divine beauty will burn down everything that his sight falls upon. Accordingly, it is probable that كَيْفَ يُوسَفُ عَبْدٌ اِحْتَجَبَ اللَّهُ بِسَبْعِهِ means that for the Prophet, most of all those veils have been removed so that out of the 70,000, only seven remain. According to this interpretation, the phrase involves an ellipsis and means احتجب الله عنه بسبع with God the glorious as the active subject of the verb احتجب. Although this interpretation is perhaps more appropriate than the other probable meanings, it is not indisputable. From the viewpoint of wording, a more appropriate expression for the description to convey such a sense would be ما أحتجب أن الله إلا بسبح or ما أحتجب الله أنه إلا بسبح as in accordance with this interpretation, the perfection of the messenger and the impermissibility of describing him relates not to the presence of the seven veils, but to the absence of the other veils. It would have been more appropriate to mention them. Moreover, from the viewpoint of meaning, since apparently these veils of light and darkness that belong to God, the exalted, pertain to creation and not to the names and the attributes, and it entails that there is a creature nearer to the divine essence than the sacred light of the noble messenger, whereas it has been established that his being is the nearest veil and the first creature, and there are not even any veils of names and attributes for that master as has been proved in its own proper place, and the sevenfold stations and mysteries of that master are also not a veil for himself. A second interpretation is the one pro offered by the erudite traditionists, the Marhum Majlisi, may God elevate his station in the realm of sanctity, which he also narrates from some others. According to this interpretation, this sentence is mentioned in the way of introduction, and intended to describe the Prophet through later sentences. That is, it means to say, how could be described as how could a servant be described for whom God, who is concealed from the creatures with seven veils, has made obedience in the earth like obedience to him in the heaven like a king who is situated beyond seven curtains for his subjects, who cannot have access to him except through the mediation of a vizier appointed for them? and who sends a decree declaring that his command is mine. And that which is meant by the sevenfold veils are the seven heavens from beyond which the revelations of God reach us through the messenger. He has also mentioned another possible interpretation close to this one, wherein the sevenfold veils are identified as the luminous veils of the names. Although this interpretation, like the former, is not contestable from the viewpoint of its meaning, it is inadequate, or rather more far-fetched, from the viewpoint of wording and description. There is another probable interpretation of it, which is much sounder and convincing, and more appropriate to the occasion. However, the correctness of this interpretation depends on one of two things. Either that ihtajab has been used in a transitive sense in the sense of hajaba, or that it be permissible to make it transitive with a ba, and in both the cases there be an ellipsis involving the object mafaul. Assuming the propriety of one of these two matters mentioned, this is what is meant in accordance with this interpretation. How could a creature be described whom God the Exalted has concealed with seven veils, and for whose beauty and spirituality, which are on a par with the divine will, Mashiach, he has assigned seven veils extending from the plane of corporeal nature to the plane of the absolute Mashiach, or from the plane of the corporeal realm of Mulk of that master to the unseen station, Maqam al Ghaib, of his Ipsiti, Hubiya? I could not find any instance in the lexicon and usage for the transitive meaning of although some scholars state that there is no impediment to making it transitive with Abba. Arabic text, English translation. And all knowledge is with God, 
and perchance he may make something to come about hereafter. The delegation tafweeth of the affair to the Messenger of God, as indicated by this and many other traditions. It should be known that the term tafweeth is used in a special sense in discussions on jabr and tafweeth, predestination and total human freedom. According to the sense of tafweed, it means that God, the exalted, has na'udhu billah dissociated himself in some respect from making any kind of dispositions in the world right from the remotest extremity of creation pertaining to the unseen and material spheres, to the other end of the realm of creation and corporeal existence, and delegated its administration to a being which is either a perfectly and completely spiritual and immaterial being possessing will and freedom of action, or a physical existent devoid of will and consciousness, which has a complete freedom of independent action therein. Tafweed, in the sense of delegation of divine functions to someone, either in the matter of creation, taqween, or that of legislation, tashri, or on the plane of administration of the affairs of the creatures and their instruction, ta'deeb, is impossible, and it implies the affirmation of deficiency and contingency in relation to the necessary being and negation of contingency and need in relation to contingent being. Opposed to it is jabr, which means negation of causal efficiency in relation to the various planes of existence and an outright negation of the entire system of causes and effects. This notion is also absolutely false and contrary to firm metaphysical proofs. This is not restricted to the acts of legally responsible people, nukallafoon, as is generally known. Rather, the negation of jabr and tafweed in the sense is the operating sunnah of God in all the planes of being and in all the spheres of the seen and the unseen. However, the proof of this matter lies outside the scope of these pages. The traditions negating jabr and tajweed are to be taken to apply to these meanings of the terms. The term tafweed has some other meaning in those traditions which do, do affirm tafweed, such as the following tradition of al-Kafi from Imam al-Baqir al-Salam concerning the legislation of certain laws by the Prophet himself, or those which mention the delegation of all the affairs of the creatures to the Prophet, like the second tradition of al-Kafi given below. In the first noble tradition of Al-Kafi, it is narrated with Isnad from Imam al-Baqir al-Salam that he said, The Messenger of God وسلم, prescribed the dam damage as dhiya for loss of an eye in life, and he forbade nabith and every intoxicant. Someone asked him, Was that without anything being revealed to him? The Imam replied, Yes, that was in order that God may know those who obeyed the Messenger of God and those who disobeyed him. In other such instances, the Prophet ﷺ added a number of rak'ahs to the daily prayers and made fasting during the month of Sha'ban and on three days of every month mustahab. The second tradition is as follows, Arabic text, English translation. Al-Kulaini reports with his isnad from Zurara that he said, I heard Abu Ja'far and Abu Abdullah salam say, Verily God the Almighty and the Glorious has delegated the affair of his creatures to his Prophet to see how they obey him. Then he recited this verse, Take whatever the Messenger brings you and refrain from whatever he forbids you. Eminent scholars have mentioned certain probable meanings and interpretations. One of them is that which the erudite traditionists al-Majlisi relates from Thiqat al-Islam al-Kulaini and most of the traditionists, and which he himself favors. The gist of it is that God the Exalted, after that he made the messenger so perfect that he would not opt for anything that is not in conformity with what is true and correct, and nothing would enter his blessed mind, which is opposed to God's will, delegated to him the determination of some matters, such as adding to the number of rak'ahs in obligatory prayers, the determination of supererogatory matters relating to prayer and fasting and so on.
This delegation of weed was to make manifest the dignity and majesty of the station of that master near God the Glorious. However, his determinations and choices are not without inspiration and revelation, and after that, master prescribed something. The matter was affirmed by revelation. Marhum Majlisi, may God elevate his station, also mentions other matters similar to this one, such as the matter of teaching, instructing, and administering the creatures which has been delegated to him, or that of proclaiming and expositing of the ahkam, or refraining from that in accordance with the exigencies of time, such as while observing taqiyah, which have been delegated to him and the other masumun. However, in any of the two interpretations offered by these revered scholars, the scope of tafweed has not been explained as a rational principle consistent with established principles. Moreover, the distinction between this tafweed and the tafweed which is impossible remains unexplained. Rather, that which is implied by their statements, especially those of Marhum Majlisi, is that it would be affirmation of impermissible tafweed to believe that someone other than God, the exalted, can create cause death, provide sustenance, and give life, that one who holds such a belief is an unbeliever, a kafir, and no rational person would doubt its being tantamount to apostasy. Moreover, they have considered the matter of miracles, majazat, and miracle, and miraculous feats, karamat, as being totally a result of an unanswered prayer result of answered prayer, wherein God is the agent of the occurrences. However, the tafweed of the teaching and instruction of creatures and the bestowal and withholding of anfal and khums and the laying down of certain laws is considered correct and proper. This topic is one of those which have rarely been clarified and hardly ever brought under a correct criterion. Mostly, what they have done is to take an aspect of the matter and discuss it. This author too, with his inadequate capacity and ineptitude and the poverty of his equipment and means, cannot enter this perplexing valley by starting from the preliminaries. However, he's compelled to make a brief allusion in the way of a metaphysical conclusion, for the disclosure of truth is unavoidable. Brief allusion to the meaning of tafweed. It should be known that there is no difference whatsoever between big and small matters in regard to the impossible tafweed, in the sense of total suspension of divine activity, maghluliyat al-yadullah, and independence of the efficiency of any creature's will and power, in the same way as the giving of life, the causing of death, creation, annihilation, and the transformation of one element into another cannot be delegated to any being, so also the delegation of the movement of a piece of straw to any creature is impossible, though it be an archangel, an apostle, or any other being from the non-material intellects and inhabitants of the highest Jabaruth to the realm of the primal matter. All the particles of the universe are subject to the divine, perfect will, and have no independence whatsoever of their own in any respect. All of them are needy and poor in their being, as well as in their own tech perfections, movements and pauses, power and will, and all their functions. Rather, they are sheer poverty and absolute need. Similarly, there is no distinction between major and insignificant matters in respect of God's sustaining power over being in the negation of independence of creatures and the manifestation and influence of the divine will and its all pervasiveness, in the same way as such weak creatures as we have the power to carry out feeble actions, such as our bodily movements and pauses, and all the other activities, the elect of God and the non-material angels are capable of performing such great acts as giving life, causing death, providing sustenance, creation, and annihilation. The angel of death is in charge with taking life, and his taking of life is not something like the fulfillment of prayer. And Israfil is in charge with the giving of life, which is not of the nature of a prayer answered, and these actions do not fall under invalid tafweed. In the same way, if a perfect wali and a potent pure soul, such as the spirits of the prophets and the awliya, are and were to have the power to annihilate and create, to cause death and give life, a power given to them by God the exalted, it would not be an instance of impossible tafweed and should not be considered invalid. 
the delegation of the affair of the creatures to a perfect spirit whose intention is annihilated in the divine intent and whose will is an image of the divine will and which does not will anything except what god wills and makes no move except that which is in accordance with the best system nizam al-aslah whether in creation and bringing into being or in legislation and instruction that is not only not impossible but quite proper in fact, this is not the fweed as pointed out in the tradition narrated by Ibn Sinan to be cited in the next section. In fine, tafweez in the first sense is not permissible in any matter and is contradictory to firm metaphysical proof. In its second sense, it is permissible in all matters. Rather, the system of the universe is not realized without the order of causes and effects. Aballahu an yujri al umura illa bi asbabiha. God does not make things happen except through their means and causes. It should be known that that which has been said here briefly is rational and in accordance with sound metaphysical proof and mystic teaching as well as in conformity with tradition and god is the guide the station of the imams Know that the pure and fallible Ahl al-Bayt have certain lofty spiritual stations on the spiritual journey towards Allah whose epistemic apprehension is beyond human capacity and above the intellects of the people of reason and the intuitions shuhud of the Gnostics. As is apparent from the noble traditions, they share the spiritual station of the noble messenger وسلم, and their immaculate lights were engaged in the glorification and praise of the sacred essence before the creation of the world's Arabic text. English translation in Al Kafi Al Kulaini reports with his isnad from Muhammad ibn Sinan that he said, I was with Abu Jafar, the second Imam salam, when I mentioned before him the disagreement amongst the Shia. Thereafter, he said, O Muhammad, verily God, the blessed and the exalted, is ever unique in his unity. Then he created Muhammad, Ali, and Fatima. They remained for a thousand eons. Then he created all the things and made them witness their creation and decreed them to obey them, delegating their affairs that is of the creatures to them. Hence they permit whatever they will and forbid whatever they will, and they will not know anything except what God the Exalted wills. Then he said, O Muhammad, whoever goes beyond this creed transgresses the bounds of right doctrine, and whoever lags behind perishes, and whoever adheres to it attains to the truth. So hold on to it, O Muhammad. Arabic text. English translation. In Al Kafi Al Kulaini reports with his isnad from Al Mufaddal that he said, I said to Abu Abdullah alayhi salam, how was your state when you were in the shadows? He replied, O Mufaddal, we were with our Lord and there was none else except us in the green shadow. We glorified him, called him holy, and won and extolled him. Besides us, there was neither any archangel nor any spirit, until when it appeared to God to originate the creation, thereupon he created whatever he wills and whom and howsoever he wills of the angels and the other creatures. Then he gave the knowledge of that to us. The traditions relating to the nature tina, of their bodies and the creation of their spirits and hearts and those which speak of their having been given the knowledge of the greatest name, Ismail Azam, and the sciences bestowed upon them from the unseen divine stores of the prophets and the angels and what is above that and that which does not enter into the imagination of you and me and that which is mentioned of their other excellences in the various chapters of reliable works of our associates, especially in the usul al are such as to confound the intellect. No one can apprehend their mysteries and realities except their own sacred beings. In this noble tradition, in whose exposition we are presently engaged, there is a reference to one of their excellences, which is the verse of the purification, Al-Ayat al tathir Surah 33, verse 33, which in accordance with Mutawattir traditions narrated through Sunni and Shi'i chains of transmission was revealed concerning the infallible Ahl-Bayt
Those who are meant by Ahl al-Bayt in the noble verse as affirmed by the consensus of the Shia and abundant or mutawatir traditions narrated through non-Shia amma chains of transmission are the household of infallibility, ismah, and purity, tahara. This is a point whose elaboration would be explanation of what is evident, reality of ismah. In this, as well as other noble traditions, rijs in verse 33, Surah 33 has been interpreted as doubt, shak, and in some traditions it is interpreted as freedom from all defects. A study of the exposition of some of the earlier traditions shows that the negation of doubt implies the negation of all inward and outward defects, and in fact implies infallibility isma. That is because infallibility is not something contrary to free will, as in the case of matters relating to nature and instinct. Rather, it is a spiritual state and a light acquired by means of the perfect light of certainty, yaqeen, and total tranquility, itminan. The errors and sins that are committed by human beings are due to inadequate conviction and faith. The degrees of conviction and faith are so various as to be beyond description. The perfect certainty of the prophets and their complete tranquility acquired through unmediated knowledge Mushahidah, ye hudarriyah, makes them immune to error. The conviction of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib had brought him to the station that he declared, even if I were to be given the whole world in order to unjustly deprive an ant of a grain, I would not do it. In any case, by God's pre-eternal design, they have been cleansed of shirk and doubt, purified from the impurities and defilements of the world of physical nature, alam tabiyat and the darkness of attachment to other than God the exalted, freed from the obfuscations of the ego and the thick sheets of egoism, and attention to other than God, becoming sacred divine lights and complete sign of the Lord, who has made them purely and surely his own. Hence their stations are such as cannot be properly described and explained, and like the phoenix of the ghaib of divine obsity, the peaks of their glory are beyond the reach of Gnostic aspirations. Arabic text, English translation, take thy net away for none can ever catch the phoenix. The indescribability of faith. It should be known that Iman faith is also one of the spiritual perfections whose radiant reality can rarely be known by anyone, even the faithful. So long as they remain in the world and in the darkness of nature are unaware of the radiance of their faith and dignity they have before God. As long as man remains in this world, he becomes so accustomed to its conditions and habits that when he hears anything about the nobilities and bounties of the other world and its punishments and disappointments, he immediately compares them to a similar form in the realm of the mulk. For instance, he compares the nobilities promised by God the exalted to the faithful and the bounties he has prepared for them, and whose news has been conveyed by the prophets to the gifts and honors received by men from princes and suzerains or something better than higher. He assumes the bounties of that world to be like those of this world, though somewhat more refined and superior. Such a comparison is altogether invalid. The bounties of that world, its delights and fragrance cannot be truly imagined by us, and anything like them does not enter our minds. We cannot conceive how a drink of the water of paradise can possess all the imaginable and possible pleasures, each of which is distinct from the other, for the quality of any delight of that world has no similarity to the pleasures of this world. In this noble tradition, there is a mention of one of the nobilities of the faithful, which in view of the people of Gnosis and the people of the heart, are incomparable to anything, and cannot be measured by any measure. And that is the statement of the tradition where it says, Indeed, when the believer takes his brother with a hand on meeting him, God looks at them, and sins are shed from their faces, and the manor leaves fall from a tree. The same theme recurs in many other traditions, such as the following one, Arabic text, English translation. In Al-Kafi, Al-Kulaini reports with his isnat from Abu Ja'far salam that he said, When the faithful meets and takes one another by the hand, God the exalted turns to them with his face, and their sins fall from them, and the manor leaves fall from a tree.
God only knows what inner luminosity and nobility is associated with this look of God, the exalted, and this attention of his with his noble face, and what veils are removed from between the faithful servant, and the lights of the beauty of the sacred essence, and what secure it provides to the faithful. However, one should know the reality and actual secret behind these nobilities, and one should not be heedless of it. The heart's attention should be turned so that the act attains its perfect luminosity and a divine breath is blown into the act's body. That reality and secret truth lies in strengthening the bond of love and cordiality and renewal of the covenant of love and brotherhood for the sake of God. Great significance is attached to this point in the noble traditions and is also hinted at in traditions relating to this topic. Arabic text English translation. In Al Kafi Al Kulaini reports with his isnad from Abu Jafar al salam that he said, When the faithful meet and take one another by the hand, God places his hand between their hands and shakes hand with the one who has greater love for his companion. It is stated in another tradition that when the faithful meet and shake hands, God the exalted sends his mercy down upon them. Nine-tenths of it belong to the one who has greater love for his companion, and if they should be equal in love, the mercy envelops them. There are many traditions on this topic, and that which have been cited will suffice. And all praise is God's at the beginning and the end.